Welcome everyone to our webinar today on advancing strategic innovation for interagency and intergovernmental affairs teams in 2023. Always great to get the year started off um, strategically and right for, for everyone joining um, the session today. Uh, so we have an amazing panel. We have uh, just about an hour to share insights with you. So in terms of uh, our session, we'll ask our first question, have our panelists um, give a brief bio uh, on themselves. Uh, during the webinar, feel free to ask questions through the Q&A function in Zoom, and we'll attempt to answer those in real time or towards the end of the session. Uh, so everyone knows um, we will send out uh, a one pager at the end enca encapsulating you know, the insights and best practices that the panelists will share with you. Um, the whole idea is to approach the audience with kind of two types of users in mind or two types of professionals in mind. Those who are seasoned pros and those who are relatively new to the role, you might have just joined an agency over the last few months. Uh, so you have a little bit different uh, perspective. I will briefly share the um, our agenda for today. And you'll see we will cover uh, preparation, uh, communications, opportunities, and challenges in month 34 of COVID, uh, crisis management, building great relationships and alliances, and being an asset uh, when you can. So with that, I will um, turn it over to my panel. Uh, our first question and topic is preparation. What does it mean to you uh, for your organization and your approach to uh, intergovernmental affairs in general? And Jennifer, we'll, we'll start with you. Thanks, Michael. I'll start with the preparation uh, piece and then tell you just a little bit about my uh, journey to this role. And I guess in terms of preparation, the, I want to leave a meeting with the team that you met with anxious to schedule the next meeting, afraid of what they're going to miss if you if they don't schedule you so that um, you work backwards from how to prepare to get to that result in the end. Um, I started my full time career in government at the Department of Treasury, and I was pretty sure at that time that Treasury was the center of the universe and um, it might have been close to it. Uh, there was the SNL scandal and soaring Latin American debt crisis, and we're trying to get to a budget agreement at the same time. Um, and it, but it wasn't until I spent time on Capitol Hill as a chief of staff, and then now leading government relations for um, the Food Industry Trade Association, that I really understood the importance of the strategic intergovernmental relationship piece and preparation, especially during the time of a crisis. And I know we'll get to that next. Excellent, thanks, Jennifer. Um, David, uh, what are your thoughts on approaching preparation? You're, you're on mute, David. Well, see, if I would have anticipated that, I could have. That that leads to to what I wanted to say is in preparation. What works really well for us and is being able to anticipate what the uh, questions might that might come up, being able to uh, know ahead of time or have an idea ahead of time of possible um, areas or directions that a, a meeting or um, an interaction might go, and then knowing and anticipating the priorities of the person or the group that you're meeting with. A little bit of a background on me, I, I come more from the private sector. I spent a number of years in um, the tech industry uh, out in uh, California, Northern California. I spent a number of years there, and then I came over here to Washington, D.C. Um, with the McKeon Group, and we are a boutique firm. We represent a number of different clients in a number of different sectors, and we help them to navigate Washington, D.C. Excellent. Thanks, David. Um, Vin, last but not least. Thanks, Michael, and thanks, everybody, for having me here today. I'm 
So I'm a big believer in over preparation. I feel that that is really the key in formulating your message and being persuasive and to any interaction you're going to have, whether it's professional, personal, or, you know, all around. Um, I agree with David and Jennifer very much so, but I also just want to say sometimes it's not just anticipating the questions, but how can you steer it to where you want it to go? You know, I, I often think of reaching out to legislators before a public hearing, for example, and planting questions ahead of time. So that way, nothing's taken for granted. I know the messaging I want out there is going to get out there from policymakers. And it's a good way of ensuring that it, it's, you have the commitment from them to, to really move forward on the things that interest you the most. Um, I come from the legislature originally, like 20, this is my 24th year in government service. I started with the House of Representatives in Connecticut as a legislative assistant for leadership, moved into the judicial branch where I was responsible for reforming the probate court system in Connecticut, which had been um, needing an update. And now I'm here in the executive branch at DCF, Department of Children and Families in Connecticut, where we've also really focused on turning around an agency that, as, as a lot of child welfare agencies know, can be a difficult one to manage. But we are, you know, I that preparation has helped me work with leadership and policymakers to be a change maker to all these different areas in which my career has led me. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Um, and uh, for, for my part, um, CEO Leadership Connect, and, and we work with about 40,000 users, primarily in the policy space and government, uh, helping them with, with outreach. And a team or data science team put together a couple slides just to kind of set the tone around preparation, which I'll just quickly share with everyone. Um, so the first, you know, we, we often hear about, uh, you know, every, everyone in the Biden administration used to be in the Obama administration, and, you know, that's factually incorrect. Uh, so you can see, uh, looking at Biden appointees, there's a really uh, wide variety of backgrounds from state and local government uh, to think tanks to consulting. And actually the nonprofit space is the primary source of appointees, at least within the current uh, Biden administration. So I think that's you know, one thing that um, you know, we should always think about our kind of personal biases of where, where um, different policymakers come from. Uh, the next one I'd like to share is just what schools people went to. Uh, you know, often in the DC area, we think, uh, you know, the world's very kind of Georgetown, GW centric, but Harvard's actually the number one school that uh, appoint, Biden appointees went to. And you can kind of see the logos uh, going down the list. Uh, not surprisingly, they're, uh, you know, DC, Maryland, you know, Virginia focused schools, but you definitely get University of California, Number two, I'm, I'm sure that has something to do uh, with the vice president. And then final slide is, it, it, you know, in the policy space, what we notice um, is so many people have a background that is, is non-STEM. Um, I think the national average is about 37% STEM. And within the policy space, it's about 24%. So yeah, three kind of pieces of data to keep in mind as you prep for for your outreach and I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll move to the, the next topic. Um, so unfortunately we're, we're 34 months into <laughs> to COVID and it still comes up and people still still get it and have you know, a variety of, of outcomes. Um, you know, David, maybe we'll, you know, we'll start with you uh, on this one because you know, there, there's opportunities where doing what we're doing right now, you know, virtual conference call, you can be very efficient, you can work from your home, take your dog for a walk after a call, you can probably get through, you know, 20 meetings in a day. Um, uh, but, you know, some agencies, you know, state, local, federal, still really aren't taking meetings. The fact that a lot of people are working from home can make it a challenge. And then if you don't know someone, and you don't have a strategic relationship, that can be a challenge too. So maybe um, you can share your thoughts on just the, you know, the challenges and opportunities with communication um, starting in January, 2023 with 34 months of COVID behind us. Yeah, I think first you have to, I, I, I wanna step back for a moment and, and look at, you know, what changed during the COVID, COVID timeframe. And, 
um, it went from where, from my perspective, because I have a little more of a, a different perspective because I, we're outside trying to get in to talk to with individuals and groups, but we went from what was primarily a, an in-person type of communication with them to a virtual. And at first it was very difficult. Everyone had different ways of doing things and trying to connect, but it, became, it eventually became very efficient. Um, efficient in that um, I could actually schedule up a number of meetings throughout the day and um, they were pretty much run on time. Um, when before we'd walk in and maybe someone was running late or the prior meeting went late or they had to get out to maybe go do votes or something like that. And it made it very difficult and I could only schedule so many during the day. But we, it, so it became more efficient in that regard. However, on the flip side of that, at the same time, um, sometimes it's very hard to read people uh, virtually. And, you know, we're all just sitting here and you're looking and many times there are cases where people aren't even on the video screen. And so you don't know if they're paying attention or, or not. And so what we have found is during that time, we wanna make sure that we're not spending all of our time just talking, that we're asking questions, that we're eliciting uh, feedback into uh, what we're doing and getting their opinions and those types of things. Now, what's interesting is now we're shifting again. And as a result, things are changing. Not everyone's the same. We have some that are still saying, hey, I want to do it virtually, while others are saying, you know, let's go in, in place. Um, I it was interesting. I was up on the hill last week, and, and as I walked into some of these offices, you could see that there are a lot of people uh, that are back uh, there up walking around and doing things and, and all of that. But um, uh, an interesting side story. So I last weekend, I was out to dinner with my wife with uh, some friends of ours, and he, he works in an agency. And I mentioned to him, I said, hey, isn't this great? We are, um, I loved it. I was up on, you know, visiting and doing things. It was just great to kind of sit across the table and, and really, you know, uh, get to know these people and to read their body language and things like that. And then his perspective was, oh my gosh, it was terrible for us because we've been doing so much now virtually. Now we're, we're, we we're open and people are coming in and it was really hard for us to get things done. So what the answer is, it's, it has to evolve. And I think we will evolve. And I think we're going to go through now even a little bit of a transition um, as we get to that. Uh, great response, David. And we, we had a question related to this topic that I'd like to have a quick follow up with you on is what's your view of kind of, you know, the informal channels for reaching out to, you know, career appointee government leaders at, you know, various level of, of government. You know, when I think of pre-COVID really dependent on the individual, but they might kind of keep hours where they're in a, you know, specific place, you know, once a week, once a month, or they're known to go to specific events. So in a way, you know, they know they have a two, three hour slot to meet with, meet informally with people. And obviously with COVID that's become much harder to do, but what are your thoughts on those informal, you know, channels? Do they even exist anymore? Uh, they are, they do exist. They're starting, they've, they've started to pop up and, and there are certain events. I think some are more efficient, if you will, than others, uh, but they are, they are coming back. And I think it's important that you, you have those because during the virtual time, we didn't have that. And so either A, I had an existing relationship or we had a, as a firm had an existing relationship, or we may know someone that has that relationship. And so we had to leverage a lot more of that th than we've ever done before. Now, as this starts to open up, we can, we can start to form our own relationships um, directly with those individuals. So I don't think it's gone away. I think you still have to maintain that side of things, which we had to train ourselves to do and, and be a little more effective that way. But I think at this point with the way things are going, you wanna be doing both. You wanna have that in-person relationship, find those events. Some of them would traditionally have been uh, effective and, and those will come back effective and even new ones now. And then the other part of what I just said, 
was uh, you know networking with people who who you know and know them and i think that that starts to bring it together excellent david and then same same question and topic oh for sure i mean covid changed how we do our work for you know turn it upside down really you know we're so used to being like in the building meeting people face to face and having that building shut down all of a sudden really made you rethink and relearn the job. And so for, for my experience, what, you know, when, when legislators were in session and the building was closed to the public, even executive branch uh, employees like myself, we were scrambling, like, how are we going to get our message across? And what we decided to do, we, we developed a communication, a strategic communications plan about specifically reaching out to those folks externally from the department to let them know what we were doing, be transparent. People were looking for information. People wanted to be able to convey information to their constituents. So we were doing, I was doing weekly emails to legislators. We were doing weekly uh, phone calls, conference calls with, with the committees of cognizance over our department. And that helped us build relationships that prior to the COVID was at, weren't really there. Like it, we, we saw it as an opportunity actually to, you know, while we're living you know, within our screens, um, reaching out to folks we didn't normally have the opportunity to talk to. And over time, we were able to really develop stronger connections to policymakers who were who who for who themselves are finding it difficult to get answers. They would come to us directly now. So they were giving us a call because of all that groundwork we were doing leading up to when they needed us into that 2021 session when it was completely um, hybrid and, and we were unable to access them. And, you know, the, and the access, I think, is really, and I know Dave was touching on this, is really the key, right? Like, they, all you can do is try to text or email or call them on the phone. They can just ignore you, and there's really nothing you can do about it. You know, whereas before, you'd be in the hall, you know, outside the chamber saying, hey, Senator so-and-so, I got to talk to you about this. That was gone. So, so and, I, and I think, again, you know, really leaning on existing strong leadership um, uh relationships were so key to getting our things done in that crazy period of time you know now as things are kind of getting out of it and we're getting back to normal like like this year in connecticut is really the first what we're calling like a normal session so the buildings are open we're having in-person public hearings again for the first time actually what's interesting is that we've learned to use the hybrid model for public hearings so in connecticut every bill that's going to be voted on has to have a public hearing or it can't be acted upon. And so people from all over the state would come in and wait hours and hours and hours to testify. Well, now that you can just be in the queue as, as part of a video testimony, we actually see more participation from the public, which is a good thing. And, and, and for us, it's easier to have our subject matter experts testify who might be working all day long, but just have to jump on to the Zoom meeting when it's time for them to answer questions. So, you know, there's definitely a give and take. And I think where we're winding up is actually better than we were before. We've learned a lot from COVID and we should really embrace the positive changes that we've seen. Obviously, some, some of the more complicated things are some of the internal stuff we're dealing with as a state agency. So, for example, you know, we have, you know, we have union contracts that allow staff to only have to be in person one day a week. That can be a challenge, particularly in the child welfare field where you want to put eyes on kids. You want to make sure people are visiting homes in person, making sure it's safe. So, fortunately, we've been able to work with our union partners to kind of get some flexibility in that understanding that this particular work needs that. So I, again, it comes down to that communication, the transparency, the back and forth where you can build an important foundation. So when a crisis like COVID hits, you can kind of be ready to, to continue your work in a way that's meaningful. And, and then you, you're in an agency that you know doesn't really have the luxury where everyone can work virtually all the time. So um, and you know many people do might not have that ability, but you know they you know, aren't necessarily forced to you know be on site. Can you add any additional color with that aspect of communication? Yes, you, you know so wh where we wound up on that is where we've said to our employees, look, you need to be in the office at least one day a week, but when you're doing your visits and whatever, you need to go in the communities and be visible and make sure you're, and, and we've gotten some really good 
feedback on that. What, what we were really surprised to find, we're, we're very big on data. We, we have a very uh, you know, integrated data system here in DCF. We wanna make sure we know what's going on and how we can change policy depending on the data that we're seeing. We noticed that our workforce was actually doing better with their reporting, like entering their reports into our computer system because they would go visit a family, go home instead of drive back to the office and then drive home and just enter the data in right away right after the meetings because we, we, we provided everybody with you know, remote tablets and, and phones. And it was just so much, the work product became better <laughs> over, the, over the pandemic, if you can believe that, which actually led to a reduction, a 30% reduction in our caseload because we were able to actually reunify kids throughout this pandemic back with their families. And so, you know, again, you know, it was a difficult time, but you got to find opportunities in those crises. And, and it was, this was one where we, we found quite a bit, actually. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. I, I know um, just, you know, getting back to the um, uh, attendee question on informal channels, we did a uh, client happy hour last night, and a couple people had mentioned, even though it was, you know, miserable weather in, in DC yesterday, they look forward to it because there's actually a reason to get out of the house because they're working remotely, you know, most like probably four or five days a week. And I've certainly found that, you know, personally and with my team, that the, you know, coffee, you know, coffee meeting or, you know, grabbing a snack outside of the office is more compelling today than it was was pre-COVID, uh, but then to your point on on the Zoom calls, I did attend a jury selection Zoom call meeting and 300 people on Zoom who've never used it before is uh, is a lot worse experience than going to the, the courthouse in person. Um, Michael, I, I think what's gonna happen is, I think we're gonna have a hybrid. In, in, and as Vincent was talking about, there are gonna be certain things, certain events, certain things that we do that are gonna to gravitate to in person. And then there are gonna be some things that we do that, that are more effective or just as effective virtually. And so I think it's gonna be different than pre-COVID. It's, this is kind of the, the new world order, if you will, as we move forward with this, it's gonna be this combination or this hybrid Hey, Michael, one comment on the informal uh, pieces too, and, and I'm just going to brag on the Department of Labor because they hosted um, a holiday party during that crazy weather. Um, and it wasn't the shrimp or the bubbly that was the impressive part of, of the holiday party, but just the message that they sent that they wanted to develop these relationships and they wanted the partnerships that stretched formally and informally beyond the fourth floor conference uh, room. So I guess... To me, the informal piece of it is, you know, the the message that the agencies are sending in allowing and, um, you know, encouraging some of those informal relationships. Um, and just one other little comment on your your question, because you started off with the thirty four month part of this thing, and I was thinking about this um, this morning, and I was reading the paper. And for those who didn't see it this morning, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal about a lunch that Roger Federer had with Michaela Schifrin um, after she had had a disastrous ski run, um, which is entirely possible for me any day, of course. Um, but he said, and it was kind of this, the message was, how do you stay on top? I mean, he did it for 24 years. How do you stay on top at such a high level for a long time? And he had kind of, there's a, it means a huge article, it's worth a read, but the two pieces that I took out of it was one, be selective about what you do. You know, we started this COVID thing and, you know, we were on 20, 25 calls a day and on topics that we would have never delved into before. And I think that's a message for us right now. We've got to start narrowing that down and really taping, taking a deeper dive into the key things that are so important for us. And the second thing that he said to her was to celebrate the moment. You know, there's so much bubbling going on that, you know, look at what we've done. <laughs> you know, we've done so many great things and so many changes, so many positive successes, and let's celebrate those while we pick up all the other pieces that are lying around.
that's great, great insight, Jennifer. I appreciate it. Um, so both of you touched on on crisis or crises, uh, and that's our next topic: crisis management. Uh, and I think there was a common theme in our in our prep that you know, the next, even though the next crisis might be difficult to predict, your stakeholders uh, often are not difficult to predict. So. Maybe David, because um, I know you have uh, a time commitment coming up. Maybe we'll start with you on this topic. Well, that, that, that's that's kind of an open question, right? Um, because uh, as we as we look at this, we don't know what the next crisis is. But I, I think the way to really kind of determine how to do it is is to get to know. Um, get to know your audience. I know that sounds basic. It's something that we've learned at, at, at a very early time in, in all of our careers, but it's, it's getting to know them, getting to know what's important, getting to know their priorities. And I think that once again, gets back to what I said at the very beginning is it helps them to anticipate what, how they will react within, within a crisis and knowing their priorities. That's the best thing we can do at this point. Um, and then the last thing I'll say on that is you got to be flexible. We live in an environment where uh, a lot of different things can happen. A lot of things can change um, literally overnight. And so you've got to be able to um, flip and you've got to be able to, to uh, go after things um, very quickly. You, you can't sit there and and say and dwell on hey you know we missed we missed the target no it, there always is a target you just have to be flexible enough to uh, maneuver and get that and I know that's kind of a high level view of things because I think specifically it's hard it's hard because we don't know and so you have to you have to be able to adjust on the fly. In, in David in in prep um, you and Howard talked about you know often someone starts uh you know acting on you know a crisis too late it, it, you know might have just been you know an, an issue or a conflict and then they let it you know fester or however you want to describe it and then it becomes a crisis after six tw you know 12 months you know any any thoughts on on maybe preventing that you know that issue from becoming a crisis well i i think the first thing you have to do is uh go at it a lot of times people say, hey, let's wait and let's just see how this how this turns out or or they sit back. It's easy to do that and wait and see how how others react. And um, while in some cases that that could be OK, but a lot of cases, if you wait, it, it does bubble up. And so it's better to um, to to go at the crisis early, understand why it's a crisis and understand uh, why you know, if, uh, it, how individuals feel about that crisis. If you wait, it's it's gonna be too late. Great, thanks, David. Uh, Jennifer, how, how, how would you approach a crisis based on where you are now, but where you've been in the past? Uh, no, well, I guess I'll start with where, we're, where I am now. In terms of the food industry, we think we're really good at crisis uh, pieces. I mean, in terms of, the number of things that we've faced and come out on the other side and hurricanes and uh, other weather emergencies and food recalls and acts of violence. and But we've never had a crisis of the scope uh, and the time duration of this uh, COVID crisis. We've always been able to kind of identify resources in other parts of the country or, you know, identify something that you could utilize or a model you could um, um, direct for a short period of time to, to get you through a, a piece. So the the difference in this has been the duration and the mag, you know, and the and the uh, the scope in terms of a, a not only national but international focus. And I think the key, but the key piece is still important, and that's having a regular format for clear, concise, authoritative communication. Um, that includes your trusted partners at the agencies, so that uh, as well as your members on the ground, so that everybody's hearing the feedback and everybody is sharing the updates in real time. Um, you need to determine in advance, uh, like now, who you're going to need on your next emergency calls, whatever those are, when the best time is to schedule those calls and have your list ready to go. 
save it in your drafts so that all you have to do whenever there's a crisis is press send. Um, because you're not going to have the time to assemble the numbers or assemble the emails of, of all of those people that you need. And allowing everyone to hear the same information at the same time really cuts down on the misinformation. And it also cuts it down onto a, uh, on a lot of unnecessary one-off phone calls. So to allow people to accomplish their goals during the day and then report out on everything, you know, to everyone at the same time period. That's a model that's worked really well for us over a number of different types of crises. And uh, I, I would say it, it's definitely worth a try. Well, Michael, I need to step out here for a moment. I have a, another appointment that, that got scheduled. I really like, you know, what uh, Jennifer was talking about. And the, the it, it piqued one, one thing, and that is <clears throat> when we run into a crisis, f from our perspective, we also have to get confirmation that it is a crisis. And having relationships and having maybe two or three uh, avenues or, or groups that you can talk to to confirm that it is indeed a crisis and, and really, really helps. Um, sometimes if you just talk to one, it's a crisis. But if you talk to a second group, they say, well, it's not as much of a crisis as you think. There are alternatives uh, to this. And so I think it's important to make sure that you're dealing, uh, you're getting it from two or three sources, if you will, uh, on that. And those sources are varied. Sometimes they're individuals, sometimes they're media, sometimes it's, um, it's you know, something that, you know, uh, uh, an expert, a panel, um, uh, things like that. Um, but the key is it's got to be quick. And so you, you need to have well, I'm going to just go back for us, it works out to have relationships, because then we can go back to them. And these are relationships that have been set up prior to the crisis. It's much harder to get, try and create a relationship during a crisis. You want to have those prior, it goes back to all of our preparation that we talked about, to, to do that. And, um, and then getting that feedback from two or three other sources really helps. And that helps to then direct you in how you solve the crisis or how you uh, react to the crisis. You know, Michael, I'd like to just follow up on what Dave said, because I, I completely agree with that, how critical those relationships are before the crisis occurs, and even more so, have your external partners be part of it, be part of your team. So, for example, we always say, you know, we're the child welfare agency, but we're not the child welfare system. We have other agencies that we work with. We have nonprofit providers that we work with. We have parents. We have advocate groups. So, all of us are in this together. So if any one thing hits any of us, we all need to respond to it as a joint effort. So that way, you know, otherwise you're, you're just going to all be pointing the gun at each other. And so by, by establishing that early on and maintaining that throughout all the good times, when your house is on fire, you have a good network to help you when something bad, you know, for DCF, we're always one incident away from a crisis. You know, all we need is one child going through a horrible situation and we're all over the place. And what we need to do is make sure that we've worked with everybody else and, and that we, we know our, our practice is sound as, as Dave and Jeff to be proactive. You know, we, we've tried to be transparent, share what we're doing and, and be flexible. Don't be static in your, in your approach to things either. Like, you know, when a crisis comes, it's time to reevaluate. Is there, do an assessment. Maybe there's something that we're not doing right that can be better and we should tackle that head on rather than try to just stick our head in the sand. And, and when a, uh, any entity does that, I think policymakers especially appreciate that and will understand that more than somebody who just tries to explain it away. And then, so for, for someone who's relatively new to their agency or office, like building those relationships before the crisis happens, like what's the what's the time frame on that obviously you know some mm -hmm. people are um you know directly <laughs> tied into your success so they're kind of um you know on your team in the first place but that maybe larger stakeholder community you mentioned you know in your case uh parents and probably other mm -hmm. non you know, nonprofits. um you know what are your thoughts on that well i, I mean i can just say what like my experience has been so you know you're right i've only been at dcf for four years um, however, I have worked with the legislature for a long period of time, so a lot of those legislative relationships have 
have come with me, right? And I'm just from a different perspective. But what I did is that when I first started at DCF, I reached out to providers, I introduced myself, I took part in as many panels as I could, I wanted people to feel comfortable to talk to me. And so I really made it a point to travel around the state, this is 2019 pre COVID, so I could do that, travel around the state to different meetings and make sure I was visible, and put myself out there for people uh, again to to ask because they weren't they didn't know who I was right they had to get comfortable with me as well and so it's a it's a real back and forth in that um, you know and, and it can be it can be difficult because some people are more responsive than others I mean that's just human nature but you know I've always felt that um, if I'm if we're working together on something we need to kind of have a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of a and, and an understanding of one another in order to get that done. And so I've always made it a point when like in Connecticut, we have legislative sessions at certain times of the year, the off session time, I'm out there talking to people still I'm just I'm constantly doing that. We talk about those informal opportunities, you know, we're set, we always set up opportunities for people to come to our different events, or I'll go to different area offices and meet with like our staff out in the field. And I want to hear from them because I can make better laws if I know what they're seeing on the ground and where the gaps are. And that's what's so critical about that, that network and maintaining a network that is, that is strong, um, especially prior to a crisis occurring. And Ben and our prep, you made a great point uh, regarding you know, crisis communication. And mm -hmm. often when we think crisis, we think external, like what, what's out there in the media, what, mm -hmm. you know, what's out there in the legislative branch, you know, district, you know, what have you. You mentioned the importance of communication with your own staff. Can you, right. you know, follow up on that? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, you know, well, I, as I said earlier during COVID, you know, we we're doing all this external communication, but part of our strategic planning was also to make sure our area offices knew what we were doing as central office and our coordinated efforts with all the other agencies and the governor's office to get us through and, and keep the state running throughout this process. And so we were having daily um, called agency calls with like a, you know, office director levels and up. So that way we all were in the loop. We were, we were sending out notices almost daily that we, and we were asking our office directors to have staff meetings like in this, you know, in a Zoom format. So that way everybody knew what was going on and there was no um, questions, you know, and, and, and people had a ton of questions. People were scared. You know, we were asking people to go into homes still and make sure our kids were okay. And so how do you get them, you know, protective gear? How do you get them the ability to access homes? You know, a lot of families are saying, don't come in here. You know, we're not, we don't want anything to do with you. And how do you, so we were working with our, our staff to make them more comfortable with the notion of, okay, well, just Think, think creatively, you know, go, go visit them in the driveway, go meet them in a park, just get hands, get eyes and hands on so you can at least assess what's going on and make sure everything's okay to the best of your ability. And, and by maintaining that, that trust with our staff, as much as you trust with the external people, it really helped us implement things quickly because our staff was confident in the direction we were moving in because of that constant flood of communication and the back and forth, you know, again, we asked our staff to let us know what we're doing that's not working so we can adjust. And again, that goes back to that point about not being, you know, stuck in your ways. You have to be willing to evolve, especially during a crisis, so that we can get out the other side in a better position. Awesome, great, great insight, Ben. Um, so we, we've been touching a lot on building relationships, so that, that's our next topic of discussion. Building great relationships uh, and alliances that last. We had a question from the floor regarding how do I incorporate district state staff into my congressional engagement strategy? If you want to uh, you know, plug that into your answer, that'd be great. We'll start with Jennifer. No, absolutely. And I think Vince uh, touched on been touched on that at the beginning in terms of your staff relationships. One of the things that we started during COVID was a daily quick 15 minute touch base call in the morning so that um, the, the person who was a lead on a particular issue could give each of us a snippet going into the day for the day's work. And I think that's a 
that would be a great idea for that district uh, congressional staff too, to hear that, you know, just a quick um, update um, from the team. And, and at times when the members down in the district offices, then that's going to be, they're, they're going to be the ones that are, that are providing that update. Um, but in terms of being um, an asset to the agency, uh, really providing them with, with to the agency or to the to the offices with information and resources that they couldn't get anywhere else. You know, be open to requests that that uh, you may get for research or for best practices documents or explainer videos. Um, you you want to ensure that they can get their message out. Uh, to your members. So it's, it's a combination of both of you are trying to share information and get information out to, to uh, sets of, of members. A couple of, you know, kind of specific ideas, um, at least for those of us on the outside looking in, trying to get in uh, Vin's uh, pieces to sign up for every time the door is open uh, to be a part of it. Um, attend the events. Uh, whether it's an in-person event or on Zoom, I don't know how many different Zoom intros we've done over, over the past uh, few years, but sign up for the emails, volunteer to participate in um, the listening sessions, uh, go to the hearings. Now we can actually attend, Michael, the congressional hearings. So go to the congressional hearings and see who you're going to run into in, um, you know, in, in all of those various formats. So to, to be a part of the process and truly develop those relationships. And, and in developing those relationships also, don't forget staff. I mean, I, I'm sure at the congressional level, staff is critically important. I know at the state level, staff is critically important where, you know, we'll, I will often do most of my negotiations with staff because legislators are just, they're running all over the place. They don't have time. They're not focusing on any one particular thing unless it's something they they really, really care about. And then, if it is, that gives you the opportunity to have that direct conversation with that person. But, but yeah, I, I've always, with all the young um, like um, mentees coming up to the system, I always say, don't ever disregard the staff. It's so key to build. And with them, you can build like real true friendships because you know a lot of times they're they're younger and they they're 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 as excited to be there as anybody else. And so, how do you kind of build on, you know? going out for a drink or having having a bite to eat or something it's such a such a great part of it and and look it's fun i mean you can have fun with it too when you're building relationships and that's what's so great about it um but uh um but anyway i just want to i just want to make that point uh, from from my perspective and, and jennifer we had a, a follow-up question regarding agencies like how often do they reach out to your organization is that and is that all different levels and, and how do you respond to those um, how often do the agencies reach out? Right. Almost on a daily basis, honestly. We have we have conversations and we have, you know, so many different pieces that are happening. And it, you know, don't forget the communications team at agencies too. So, you know, you have the the regular folks that might be on the policy staff, the folks that are on the scientific staff, the communications teams, um, the folks that are in compliance, you know, between, you know, the compliance folks don't always have to be the bad guys. So, you know, we have some great relationships with the compliance folks that, you know, we can jointly develop best practices guides, jointly develop uh, information pieces that are making folks aware of, of something that's, uh, that's happening out in the world. I, I'll tell you one right now that we're working on is a, um, skimming uh, with regard to cards that uh, folks may be using EBT cards or other government benefits cards to kind of warn both the stores as also uh, as well as the customers and, and the clients of, you know, making sure that they're protecting their their benefits and their cards. And, and do either of you have a you know, specific formula? So for instance, you know, perhaps David had mentioned, you don't want to be the person that every time you reach out to you know, a specific agency or organization, that person thinks you immediately want something. And, you know, they describe like, you know, take six, nine months, just send information of value, don't ask for anything in return. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to, you know, better part of the year, it's no, no small time, time investment, then you've actually built a relationship where 
if you do need to ask a favor, uh, you know, realistically, the person's going to, you know, prioritize that. You know, what are your thoughts, just specific, you know, relationship building techniques along those lines? No, that's a great point. Yeah, you don't you don't you don't always want to be in the position of asking for something. So what I what I tend to do, particularly like with new legislators, because you know, every couple of years we get new ones, is I I'll check out their bio, I'll, I'll see what interests them, and see where our interests align, and I and and then I'll just reach out and have a conversation with them, not not necessarily asking for anything, but in a lot of cases offering my help. You know, at DCF, um, you know, as legislators, same with congressional people, you know, they get calls from their constituents looking for help and they get a lot of calls from clients that we deal with at DCF quite a bit. So they know they can reach out to me and I want them to know they can reach out to me. If you're hearing from somebody who's having difficulty with our department, let me know so I can take care of it. So it's really about starting the relationship from a point of view that's beneficial to them, not necessarily to me. Um, you know, obviously over time, it really becomes a mutual, you know, I guess, I guess that's kind of how I look at it. I don't really think of, of any of these relationship as only benefiting the agency. I always think of it as being mutually beneficial. And I think that's a mind frame you have to have because otherwise it can tip the other way a little too much. And you have to just think to yourself, you know, where, what can I ask and when is it appropriate to ask it and, and make sure that that timing is right. Um, you know, for example, uh, last year Connecticut did a, bunch of bills on children's behavioral health is a hot topic nationally. Kids coming off the pandemic are struggling. What can we do about it? DCF is the lead agency in Connecticut for children's mental health services. So what we did is that we offered to have a symposium. We offered to give presentations to committees to inform them if they were interested and, and they, they took us up on it. So it was great for them because they were able to learn a lot from us. And it was great for us because it gave us great exposure about the stuff we were doing. So again, where do you find the connections? Where do our interests align? And we can, and then from there, from after those seminars, the follow up, you know, the phone calls, the emails, the pop ins. Did you, you know, was any, can I explain anything a bit more? You know, where do you think the gaps are? How can we help find, fix them? You know, that's make yourself available as, as an asset, not just a pest, I guess. And, and so that, that's a great segue then into our next topic of, of being an asset when you can when you can be so helping others achieve their their goals uh, being available to your you know your stakeholder community internal external peers uh, we've covered this a little bit but maybe Gen Jennifer do you want to you know round out the um, the thoughts on that Sure, I, th I think we did uh, cover it at a high level, but some of the more specific things I know, for instance, my association produces a lot of research so we have consumer trends research and um, research on the industry and the, the kinds of things to, that are happening in the industry and um, a food keeper app to tell you that you know how to keep your food and we those are all of the kinds of things that we share with the agencies that we're working with too to keep them up to speed on all of the trends that we're seeing um in you know in our association and in our businesses because that ultimately helps both of us in uh, reacting to the, the the various pieces that are there so i would say just in looking uh looking around you and seeing you know what are all the the developments what are all of the new pieces that you may have available and this goes on the uh, you know it goes on the agency side as well in terms of pushing those out that may not be you know specifically in the area that we're focused on but ultimately you're going to you know help that relationship and and help uh, both parties to to know the other one even better Ben, any further thoughts on that subject? Uh, no, I mean, I, you know, I, for and for me, just another, I mean, just a quick example that I that I use all the time is, you know, even even if there's a bill or some sort of regulation or policy that's being developed that doesn't necessarily directly affect me, but we might have some expertise in it, I always just offer to help craft things a little bit better. I think. I think the more people that kind of help out with legislation, the better it becomes. And so I'm, all, I'm always happy to interject. And over the years, that has led to people doing that outreach to us, asking us to participate in more things. And 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 why that's good is that now you're not an afterthought. People are seeing you as a leader in your field, 
they see your subject matter experts as leaders in their field and can offer just valuable information. And so the more you can just kind of interject yourself into things, even if it's not really <laughs> your deal, it's still a good thing to do. Uh, that's great, Ben. So we, we have a really good follow-up question uh, regarding kind of uh, identifying people and, and building relationships. So a lot of what we've been talking about are probably your stakeholders that are relatively obvious, but from time to time, you come across stakeholders that are important, but you might not have relationships with them. And, and the second part of that is you start getting into uh, the questions related to you know faith-based faith -based outreach. So I know with Department of Veterans Affairs, um, you know, probably child services, FEMA, you know, reaching out to you know churches and faith-based based organizations are an important part of the out outreach. I know for you know for my organization, we're building out tribal information because that's also important for you know certain you know federal and state agencies but that that can be hard to figure out i think in, in the question <laughs> regarding local churches you, you might have to drive around there's not an easy way to find them and they're not necessarily you know connected and certainly aren't waiting for your call so can you kind of you know speak um maybe specifically to you know you know tribes and faith-based organizations but also to connecting with that um, kind of less intensive stakeholder that you know it's important every now and then, or they're always sort of important, but you know maybe you don't get to them uh, in many cases. Maybe Jennifer, start with you. I think that's a great topic, and I'd say there is a fantastic example in um, this current White House and their commitment to this area. They have a call. I think it's every Thursday. For, for exactly those groups, the faith-based, the tribal groups, and the rural America. It started kind of on the rural piece, and um, you know we were engaged in the rural group, but then have met the folks in the some of the tribal and faith-based groups because of that interaction, and uh, it's it's a commitment that that uh, they're having, and then in conjunction, we're having more so to a broader uh, outreach to those groups, um, and you know what. I think it has to be intentional when you talk about those other relationships that are, you know, that may not be in your core core competency. I mean, we, we are, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we're talking with the folks at USDA and FDA on a daily basis, but there are those agencies that that we need to be talking to and that we have to intentionally, we have to, you know, think that through and plan it out and make sure that we're not forgetting the EPA or the Federal Reserve or the Department of Commerce or you know just a host of the, the agencies that have a role in uh, what we're trying to do and and how we might help in in the role that they're trying to do. So I think that's a I think both that's a great question. Awesome, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Vin, your thoughts? Yeah, you know it. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thought because I. I'm just one of those people that's very active. So I think of all, everybody's important. So I, I mean, so for, I mean, one thing I can give, give an example is like the lobbyists in Connecticut. So they see me, you know, I, you know, although I'm a state, a state department employee, you know, it's a very similar role, right? We're advocate, we're, I'm advocating for my department's position on different legislation, different policy, that, that nature. And so lobbyists kind of see us as kindred spirits. And so they'll come and ask me about all number of things. And, and honestly, the biggest one that that I'm not really a part of, but I always find very interesting is our procurement process, right? So how do we, as a state agency, reach out to, to contractors and, and also, you know, in the tech world, in the in, in um, uh, equipment world and, and, and leasing facilities, that sort of thing. And so, you know, it's not an area that I work with, I work on a lot, but because of my relationships with individuals that do, it kind of bleeds into my work almost on a regular basis. So, so I try to be mindful and, and make sure I talk to my fiscal team and my management team that I'm not overstepping any bounds, but still trying to keep 
them in in my sphere of influence because you know when you're dealing because i i might be working with them on a bill that does influence what something that is important to me and so i want to maintain that that friendly uh, back and forth i am just real quickly on on nate on um, tribal and and rural issues i mean that's an issue that's affecting us as well uh we're you know especially with supreme court's current arguments about the uh, indian child welfare act we're trying to see how that's going to affect changes in in the states and from Connecticut's point of view and working with our both our federal and state recognized tribes we're looking now at taking the uh, Indian child welfare language and enacting it as part of a state statute that would then expand out to state tribes and and again that's that's something that's of particular interest to me I, I I do have a minor in Native American studies for my time and um so so to do this it, it's not something that normally would be in my world but it's a fascinating thing to be a part of. And so I'm happy to, to be doing it and hopefully we'll be successful. Great, um, did not know you had that uh, that minor bit. So very, very topical. Uh, maybe we just have a couple minutes left. So maybe um, last topic is um, talking about setting expectations. So so often, and it touched a little bit on, on crisis management, um, you know, in the prep, you know, the proper setting of expectations can often, you know, prevent conflict um, or, or certainly a crisis. And maybe, you know, Jennifer, start with you on that in, in your thoughts. I think that's a great a great piece, especially during the crisis when so many things are boiling around and everybody feels like that their portion of it is the most important of the day. And you know, I for me the the I think one thing that's really helpful is putting it on paper. So you have this meeting, you have this discussion, you're on the phone, you're talking with all these folks, but then to put that back out to you know to reflect on the discussion to say, okay, what I got out of this was that here's the key thing that we need to be focused on and then we'll report back in tomorrow so that you're you're identifying the key pieces and you're putting a time frame on it in the in the middle of the crisis to me that's um that's the first step but to try to avoid that confusion great answer uh Dan. yeah you know i was just having this conversation with expectations with a friend of mine the other day because um He's got, he's got a client who's interested in working with us. And he said, you know, they hired me to communicate with you guys. And now they're saying they can't even get a meeting. And I said to him, like, no, they hired you to navigate state government in Connecticut. And sometimes you have to let them know what you're able and not able to do. I said, and I, that applies to me as well. I have to tell my people what to expect and what not to expect based on what I'm seeing on the ground at any given time. That's kind of our role. And, and I feel that people, they, you know, whether they take it personally or not, you know, you can only do so much and, and you can work as hard as you possibly can work and talk to many people and, and still not be successful because perhaps the policy is just not ready yet. An idea needs a little bit more, more work. It's fine, but you know, it's kind of up to us to not just to, to set expectations for our our stakeholders also so that way they don't get it over their skis on certain things because when it's just not going to happen awesome all right so we have uh a minute left uh any final thoughts from from the panel i think this is a great topic it's uh, incredibly timely and we could probably do a 202 uh, with a broader group on this, I, it's it's interesting, and thanks for putting it together. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say thanks for inviting me to 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 speak with everybody today. It's been a great experience, and um, you know, uh, hopefully we can do it some more. Because yeah, like like Jennifer says, we could talk about this stuff for for hours, and and just keep the questions coming. Absolutely, Dan. I, I know we had a few hours of material for this if uh, if we wanted to. So thanks very much for everyone attending. If you have any ideas for future topics or speakers you'd like to see at one of our webinars, again, we're focused on, you know, sharing best practices within public sector communities, especially with the, you know, the policy professionals, uh, you know, please let us know. Uh, please let Alyssa know who helped organize uh, this panel. Want to thank Jennifer and Vin very much and, and David. Um, 
and then the other folks that helped put this together. So thanks very much and hope everyone found it a productive hour. All right, have Thank a great you. Time.